welcome to the Rookery's Archives. My name is Louise, also known as the Nerdy Archer around the internet, and I'm your host. Sometimes called the Queen of AC Law, and sometimes even the resident law expert for the AC Sisterhood Discord, and sometimes called that really awkward kid who just needs to get a life. It's me! I'm back! Have you missed me? <laughs> And before you ask, yes, I did earn that unofficial's first title in a recent quiz that I won. Well, I say recent. It was in ha it was at Halloween, <laughs> and it's now December. Oh God, it's been so long. It has been so long. University deadlines. <laughs> what can you do? But today comes another episode from yours truly. Arguably a little bit overdue. But when I started researching and thinking about it, I just kept adding more and more ideas in. And it came a point where I just had to physically stop and tell myself that what I have is enough. I could potentially speak about this episode for hours if given up the opportunity. So if there's anything missing or points seem like they're not as detailed as usual, it's for the sake of brevity. Otherwise, this episode would be two hours long. Or what you would hear is two hours long. What I hear is three hours and a lifetime of editing. <laughs> but let's get into it, shall we? Everyone has that one game within the franchise which they know inside out. That they adore and will defend to the ends of the earth. If people haven't already guessed, for me, that's Assassin's Creed Syndicate. And Syndicate was released on consoles on October the 23rd, 2015. Making 2020 its five year anniversary, which I missed. <laughs> It also marks five years since I really officially got into the franchise. So this is sort of a monumental episode, really. Syndicate, while not the first AC game that I ever played, that um, glorious title goes to AC Unity, it was the first game that got me totally invested. You could perhaps say I took my own leap of faith the day that I decided to pre-order this game. And what I decided I would do is, today I am going to look at what we have, in the finished product for Syndicate, include some of that little devilish hurdle called real world history and some of the existing lore from the AC franchise and use that to fill in the gaps of things that we just don't know. I'm also going to be digging up some of the cut content and things from interviews that we could perhaps bring back and make it in additions into the reworkable story. I will just say there is a minor spoiler for Valhalla in here. Nothing like main story related or it's just discussion of mysteries and surprises around the world and potentially one of the hidden pieces of Eden that are in the game. So, shall we get started? The game arguably has the most upbeat ending to any game in the main franchise. It was perhaps the best introduction to the franchise I could have had. Upbeat, fun, and with music that I still call one of Austin Wintry's best soundtracks and that I admittedly now still use as background music when doing almost anything. Every time I visit London in real life, I always have Bloodline queued up to start right as I get off the train in the station and underground as I leave the city. It's basically become my life and I don't think I would be studying where I am and doing what I love and being here we didn't have this introduction, so I use Syndicate a lot. And I don't think there's a better place to start this than with our two protagonists, the Fright Twins. Evie and Jacob are still some of my favourite protagonists in the franchise. Instantly relatable, fun, and with sarcastic quips, and honestly, I wish we got more of the sibling teams in the franchise. Like, a mission with Ezio and Claudia. Yes, please. <laughs> Can we stop with the sad family dynamics? Let Let's have this fun sarcasm and the pranks and this like casual, you know, casual teasing and stuff that you see from people in real life. <laughs> the way they interact in the Crete Escape mission is the only time bar the final boss fight with Crawford Staric where they actually fight and work together and you see just how much of a unit and a team they are and they complement each other so well. And oh my god, I know that the... um dynamic of the game is that they are to be different that they gradually grow apart and their interests are different and there's that big fight at the end of sequence eight before they go and try and stop Staric at the ball but we could have had more of them <laughs> it also felt like we got a whole load more of Jacob as a focus in the game which if you haven't been aware of the news recently with everything that's going on with the AC Sisterhood movement and like the revelation of stuff behind the scenes at Ubisoft, Evie was supposed to be 
one or like equal main character if not the main character for Syndicate and most of her stuff got removed in the final game and if you look at Syndicate and you know the um, coding and the comic books for Syndicate you can still sort of see that like in the Assassin's Creed Locus um, miniseries it focuses on Evie and Henry there's no mention of Jacob in there and a point I only really pieced together while watching the Jacob Bry character analysis video which I will link below um we see the game through Evie's eyes we have access to her diaries her inner thoughts both of the twins comment throughout the game but we really only see deep feelings about Evie and the same thing happens in the Underworld novel as well we get Evie and Henry's points of view um, just nothing from Jacob. With her role being reduced and cut down from initial scripts, so I feel like some of her character arc got lost along the way. Jacob is more dynamic, it's more fulfilled, we get this full, he starts here, he learns. But with Evie, if, while we also do get this full character arc, it's the points, we don't really see the detail of it before and afterwards, we don't see her, like we get hints of her internal struggle with coming to terms over feelings for Henry but we don't see things that come to that we don't see you know at what point she made that switch fully it just suddenly became oh oh god Henry hello the last third of the Assassin's Creed Underworld novel is told from Evie's perspective and it gives you a load more insight into things that she feels about in-game sequences the final quote for the bit where you know, it feels like for a moment that Quarrelford had won. Says, regrets that she would never have the opportunity to tell Henry how she felt about him. Visit Amristar with him. How she would never make her peace with Jacob tell her brother that she loved him. So sorry for things that had turned out this way. We don't really get that fullness of character with her and it's really, really annoying. Like, I adore Evie. Evie's the main reason I think I picked up the game in the first place and... I could end up projecting my own thoughts and feelings onto Evie because, like, for those who don't know, I had a f the friend who got me into this um, ended up calling me Evie for two years afterwards because he was like, oh, I, I played the game and she reminds me of you. So, <laughs> hi, nerd. Um, but there's just so much of her character that's left f to the imagination, to what's probably ended up on the cutting room floor. We don't see beyond quite a lot of the stuff and I think that's one reason that most people or most people that I've asked anyway ended up using Evie for the for the missions that were optional so for the missions that you could choose between a twin they decided that they would pick Evie rather than Jacob but there is a really interesting dynamic of the twins is that while they are the opposites of one another they're also the opposites of, of themselves so Jacob is typically seen as these sporadic brash thinking I'm going to act now and think about consequences later if I think about them at all type of guy personality wise I saw him as like the the typical lad of his day within the inverted commas lad but the way that Jacob acts he's driven by his emotions as the complete antithesis of Evie who is driven by thought and I'm gonna plan everything A to Z rather than let my emotions get the way of the mission which is part of her character art to learn to not do that and kind of drop Ethan's teaching but with Jacob he's remarkably calmer in scenarios unless somebody pushes his buttons for example like he takes the tour of Mrs. Disraeli around Westminster and like Devil's Acre completely seriously he's a true gentleman and and one thing that Paul Amos said in one of his interviews, I think, is that he slightly changed Jacob's accent depending on who he was interacting with. So there's very much that slight Welsh bit of accent when he's interacting with, you know, he's fine, he's comfortable. But as soon as he starts interacting with people who are of a status like the Prime Minister or the Queen, his um, mannerisms become a lot more refined in a way that you would expect Evie, who is you know, knows how to act as the quote genteel young lady who only learnt musical instruments to fit in to be able to blend in in an assassin scenario. And then in contrast, Evie, who is is seen as intelligent, she's book smart, she is the thinking rather than acting, jumps into scenarios a lot quicker. So we see it with join Karl Marx, we see it Charles Dickens, um, just putting forward and saying, yes, we'll help you without like the res reservation that Jacob has so she immediately just wants to yeah let's do it let's keep going 
And I think it's a really interesting point that they both have this point of the other person in them because they're a team. They've been a team for 20 years by the point they come to Syndicate first trained by the, uh, raised by their grandmother until six years old and then for the last 14 raised by their father Ethan and f- first and foremost they are twins they are siblings like you can act exactly like your sibling and have things in common with them as much as you don't and I think it's a really nice way of showing that you know they are going to be a unit they are going to be this team even if c- circumstances and situations divide them later on a scene that was filmed but never saw the final game was the twins at Ethan Fry's funeral. Underworld reveals that their father died in the early months of 1868 from pleurisy, either at the end of January or the beginning of February during the evening. His funeral was a quiet affair which only was only attended by George Westhouse and the twins. And then boom, suddenly we're at the blooding of Ferris and Brewster. It may seem strange that their training, their steps into an official brotherhood capacity started when they were 20, 21. But the age in which um, Jacob especially would be able to vote or they would be able to do things in an adult capacity was 21 at this point. So, you know, why would they do things at 18 like we would do now when by law they technically wouldn't be able to? But we don't really know what they were like before London. What was their grandmother like? The one who raised them until they were six years old in Wales. They must have stayed in contact, surely, but we don't hear anything about her beyond the, that point of raising them. We don't even know her name. Was she still alive during 1868? Do they ha- do either of the twins have a memento from her? I like to think that the violin that you can find in Jacob's carriage on the train is a family heirloom given to them by their grandmother. And I like to think that it was originally Cecilia's, their mother's. The reason behind this is... In Bloodlines, which is the um, theme for Syndicate by Austin Wintry, there is a piano and a violin playing, and they play in harmony, and they like, you know, they play a duet. And as previously established and mentioned, Evie can play the piano, and Jacob, we don't really see Jacob in a musical capacity, but Wintry said that he imagined the two instruments as the twins, with Evie as the piano and Jacob as the violin or the cello. Do either of the twins still hold photographs of their parents when they were younger? Or, given the period, um, do they have paintings? Do they have, like, other letters they've written to their grandparents? Or George, or other members of the Assassins who knew them when they were younger, when Ethan and Cecilia were happy? And It would make a nice little collectible for photographs or letters to go... Maybe, Maybe Ethan was from London? Like, we know Cecily was from Wales, but maybe Ethan grew up in London and, you know, he has memories of meeting Cecily here. Maybe maybe St. James's Park is where he proposed. Maybe maybe Cecily loved to read. Maybe, just, just maybe. We can't do much more than maybe. And I really wish we could have had just, yeah, we we get details from Ethan, um, about Ethan and Cecily from other characters, but... But we never really know about their father, especially from the experiences of the twins, who are probably going to have subjective opinions on the parenting, Jacob especially. But a, a, th- a common theory about why Ethan is quite, you know, typically seen as a harsher parenting style to Jacob rather than Evie, is because he acts more like Cecily. While well, Evie got the looks and the appearance, um, Jacob got her personality or her eyes. But... How does George Westhouse remember them? Because Ethan recruited him to the Brotherhood. We get a little bit of that, like, um, slight cockiness from Ethan at the beginning of Underworld. But how does George remember that before? How does their grandmother remember seeing, like, the nervousness of asking <laughs> to marry their daughter? He is a ghost. Well, not the ghost. That's Henry. But he's a ghost hanging right over the entire thing. And we don't even know that much about him. And we don't even know what Cecily looks like. And we don't even know even less details about her. There's a dynamic at play there that is being heavily underutilised. And I think that a final cutscene for, you know, collecting all of these things could be something like the twins reconciling a bit more. Because suddenly they're okay at the end. They might have some ups and downs, but we don't really see how positively they interact afterwards. And, you know, the death of a parent is going to leave a lasting mark, even if you weren't overly fond of that parent. How are they going to come to terms with this? But going back to that idea of dynamics, um, one that I think we could have utilised a bit more is both twins playing the same mission. 
A Night to Remember, aka Crawford Starrick's assassination and the ball at Buckingham Palace, allowed you to play as both. And it was so much fun seeing the different approaches to things. With Jacob, you can even comment on what Evie is up to and see her in Eagle Vision dancing with Starrick while the Marzuka is going on in the background. Uh, and with Evie, you get that limited approach with dress, meaning you can't pile core and stealth while he can. But she has the slight element of social stealth there, so it kind of balances out. But I bring it up because we know that the Animus has some degree of reflecting a person's mood in certain memories. Like, see, um, Arno and Edward's depressions in their respective games, for example. But what if you could combine that with two people experiencing the same event? Memory can be subjective, so what's to say that even Jack Jacob remember their fight differently? Particularly the fight on the train beforehand. Maybe not the words and the weight behind but the weight behind them and the delivery. So Evie may mean one thing, but it registers to Jacob as something else. She wants to help. He sees nagging. Jacob's hurting so deeply, but Evie just sees him being angry and isolated and just not wanting to talk. It's how real conversations come around. And and we know that from lines that they say while going on missions or reacting to things and picking things up, that they have different opinions about things. And not every conversation is going to go off smoothly in real life either, especially with siblings. I feel as if there is a flirty attitude, which is simply just parts of Jacob's personality. He's a people person, and his way of getting to know someone is to make jokes, allow them to get comfortable in his presence, and just being friendly. He seems to be flirting with Pearl Atway, but that's just their... I don't want to call it friendship, but it's like how they connect to one another. There's confirmed of no, like, romantic relationship or, like, romantic feelings between them. But when he meets Roth, it's almost like this sort of flirtiness is turned on its head a little bit. Jacob becomes the one on the back foot, blushing under the compliments he wasn't expecting, as opposed to him being the one blush um, presenting those compliments. Or, depending on how you interpret Ethan's parenting, these are likely the first real compliments he's heard from another person for a really long time. Evie has the romantic subplot in this game, and it's completely deserved, if a bit lacking in the development and final arc from colleagues to romantic badass duo. But if we ever got to see more of the twins, I would like to have more of a developed and well-rounded romance arc for both of them. The Assassin's Creed Locust Comics uh, miniseries shows a little of Evie and Henry's casual teasing in 1872, after they've been you know, together for a while and they're still in London, and it shows how they work together whilst in missions versus, you know, the game where Henry's really treated as the load and causes a failure of the mission or two because he's just, you know, he's outside of his comfort zone. He's doing it because he loves her, but, you know, all she does is get angry back. Actually, what about Henry? Because we've talked a lot about Ethan and Cecily being very underdeveloped, but we don't really know that much about him. I'll go more in detail about this in an upcoming episode of Henry's biography on the Rookery's archives, but most of his information is just told in one um, small database entry, which not everyone is going to read. Like, did you know that Henry's real name is A, J, J. Deepmere, and B, that his great uncle is the Maharaja? Yeah. You probably wouldn't know loads of that unless you looked at the database not everyone does that being said i really do find the um like final cutscene after the um pressed flowers really really sweet and adorable and it's cute and <laughs> henry is real why can't jacob have some of that you know he also deserves to be happy having just a bit more time with both of the twins and with their arcs would give them a more fleshed out character and it's the reason why I still think Ezio is so well liked and seen as most people's quote unquote favourite character. He's the protagonist that we get to know the most and spend the most time with. We're literally with him from birth to death. And Jacob's romance arc is also just one kiss and a non-consensual one at that. Later in the Victorian period, we'd have queer figures around such as Oscar Wilde, who were, who were not just around in the period, but were around in London. Just imagine it in a sequel game for the twins, where Jacob runs into him and and he learns that being bisexual is okay. We've seen in later games that same-sex romances are available for players to choose now. And while Jacob was the first queer playable character, we don't really see that come across. Admittedly, yeah, okay, you could argue that it's the, the thoughts of the period, but Anne Lister, Gentleman Jack, was around in like the early 1800s. Oscar Wilde, again, 
died in 1900. There are queer people and we have always existed. It's just not all of their lives were as visible as a queer person might be now. But that was a lot about character development. Let's move on to side quests and the collectibles and the sort of allegiance missions that you can do in the wider game. So we know that several of Charles Dickens' side quests touched upon the supernatural if they weren't, you know, ripping off not, um, storylines from his own books, encountering figures like Spring Hill Jack and more. But London is full of ghost stories to be considered. Maybe have an entire quest line if the opportunity presented itself to have it. With so many executions occurring on his grounds, the Tower of London would be a prime target. Beyond that, it would also allow players a greater opportunity to explore in their, fr quote, free time out of the two missions and World War I segment where it is a playable location, and one of those missions is only in a DLC. In a way, it also harkens back to my discussion on a Lydia slash World War I game, or even a small tie-in story for the time anomaly. The so-called Great War saw 12 men executed at the Tower on charges of espionage, including Fernando Bushman, I think I pronounced that right, whose story has become infamous for playing the violin in this last few hours. Archaeological remains and excavations and restoration at the Tower have also uncovered findings of animal remains and evidence of cages from the Royal Menagerie that was once held there, found in the 1990s, and graffiti litters rooms that were once cells home to prisoners of years past. With graffiti and artwork etched into the walls, it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to have a possible Isu vault there. Perhaps even small visual challenges similar to the Nostradamus puzzles in Unity or stone circles in Valhalla to solve. Like... The legendary assassin's tombs in Assassin's Creed 2, with the hints of glowing writing seen in Unity and their questlines. London as a settlement has existed in some form or another for 2,000 years, so as Evie it would make perfect sense if they had some link back to her historical research. And if they happen to link back to other Isu sites we know exist from visiting them in Valhalla, uh, Stonehenge or Lindisfarne, or another location pinned on the assassination board, while it might not be completely solved by them, as, you know, some of Ezio's stuff was not completed when he did it, and Arno was, like, the rare occasion that he solved the stuff about the sage, it would be nice to have that starting point, the idea that the research means something that has may be already mentioned, or may lead into something as a background thing for another title. After you assassinate Lucy Thorne, the um, documents on the assassination board on the train change, so you get Instead of just a photo of like Buckingham Palace, you also get um, a map of the British Isles, including Ireland, and some dots mentioned on it. Two of those show a photograph of Buckingham Palace and Lindisfarne, but from what I've estimated and tried to put on the geography, you've got things like Stonehenge, you've got potentially Tintagel in Cornwall, and maybe even the Giant's Causeway in Ireland. And all of these could be key points for Isu sites or Isu references. Maybe even a little hint about the Knights of the Round Table or something. A nod to, um, you know, Monty Python could be in there or cursed with Nimue. But going back to this idea of the supernatural, ghosts at the Tower of London are perhaps a particular selling point for tourism at the site in the 21st century. With sightings from guards and tourists including figures like Anne Boleyn and the two Lancaster princes, to spectral bears and more indistinguishable be beings being confirmed. Plus, ravens and their superstition within the grounds. Even if it's not a mission, it would be an interesting piece of lore to uncover about where that came from in the first place. Sure, we have a real-world real world explanation for it, but just where did it really stem from? Was it a superstition created by an assassin-affiliated monarch? It's the little pieces of world building people. <laughs> but outside the Tower of London, the city has so many ghost stories. And I think one real world ghost story that would, again, allow players to revisit a location that you don't w visit after that particular sequence. It's the ghost of Threadneedle Street. And guess what? It's a real ghost story. So it adds in a bit of flavour for the sake of a video game, but you don't really need to change that much for it to be included. And who wouldn't want to explore the um, Bank of England with a little bit of a ghostly feel? Hmm? And none of this, of course, covers the most notable DLC released in the game, the Jack the Ripper one, set during the Autumn of Terror in 1888. I'm thankful that, particularly for the murder of Mary Jane Kelly at the end, they didn't show us the full sight of what happened. 
because it's gruesome and it's very respectful of Ubisoft to do that. But five years have gone by since this DLC was released and academic has research has developed since then. I believe this DLC, dubbed Sequence 10 by Dinga Mainu, was released now as opposed to in 2015. Some of the language used in-game and the way that which the women and the Ripper were pre presented to us would be different. There's an argument surrounding like historical tourism of such events and being the historical equivalent of watching true crime documentaries about the Zodiac Killer, etc. And people did the same during the 1800s. Queen Victoria was keenly interested in Scotland Yard's investigations, and Arthur Conan Doyle was actually at one point thought to be the Ripper due to his infamy with the Sherlock Holmes books. Many pieces of Ripperology now are presenting a more sympathetic view on the women, particularly Halle Rubin holds The Five, in which it details the life and the life of these five women beyond their grisly ends, talking about their love, their loss, what they must have done as careers, because just because they were living in the West End does not necessarily mean they were prostitutes. The Guardian Review calls it best, saying that it's calling time on the misogyny of the Jack the Ripper myth. Assassin's Creed and Ubisoft have used relatively new research time and time again, such as the interpretation of Leonardo da Vinci being gay wasn't really that widely accepted when the game has been developed as people now accept it. So why not use that now? Present this more sympathetic outlook, have histories behind the women beyond just the death. Just because something is widely accepted does not necessarily mean it's the correct answer. Isn't that what we're taught by the creed? So why are we accepting it now for the murder of five women from 132 years ago? Speaking of revisiting locations, the distinct lack of use of the Kami Mansion in Queen Anne Square after the mission played it by ear was the waste of a perfect opportunity, in my opinion. We see the twins and Henry grow an assassin of influence in London, yet we never really feel the impact. Evie draws parallels to Ezio's liberation of Rome from Brotherhood, but who says that tried and tested method can't be extrapolated to another time and location with a very similar aim? So here is what I propose. Use the mansion as an assassin bureau. Have a more physical artifact with its mechanics. And there is that practical sense and aspect of London as a centre of the British Empire. <clears throat> and have it as a hub of sending assassins across the world, building contacts, stuff we learnt from Ezio in Revelations Brotherhood. Perhaps a little nod to one-off visits across England are locked in post-game side quests with the assassination wall. <laughs> of course, Syndicate is only set in the one year, unlike many other entries in the franchise. So, outreach is perhaps limited. And the twins work so fast in reclaiming London for the assassins. No wonder there is a small part of chaotic overlap as they try to fill holes in it. I read somewhere, and you can still see it in the very first look of Syndicate at the E3 conference in 2015, that Clara O'Day's pub was meant to be the hub for the Rooks. That would be where you would get the gang wars started, and you would be able to unlock upgrades, you'd be able to perhaps even recruit people for it. A mechanic which was reduced to a small screen symbolised on a photograph or framed map on the train. But there's a scrapped idea that I would like to bring back here. And that's the idea of the world adapting to the events of the story. So, Elliotson is dealt with. Upheaval with medicine distribution, meaning it's all overly expensive. I might even have a lower limit that how many you can purchase. A particularly vindictive dev team might even make it so there's a slight chance of the healing poisoning you over a short period of time as it's not entirely regulated for what's going in. A threat of hyperinflation from the Bank of England. Everything skyrockets. You have to like maybe have a challenge getting goods. You have to loot bodies instead of purchasing them because you just have no money for anything. And with the Dreadful Crimes DLC, you were able to undertake missions as either Jacob or Evie, with both appearing and giving players the option to play in any combination that they wanted. But one idea that I had is that there could be a dynamic of each twin is able to partake in the same investigation and pick out different evidence relating to their unique skills or to their unique interests. So you, you could do, say, the first mission is Jacob and find things related to the pub or fight clubs and then draw an investigation and a conclusion based on that. And the point of the first one is that it's not the straightforward answer. You deliberately have to pick an incorrect answer first to then open up the rest of the exploration, which is what we see in the game. 
and then it would perhaps swap to Eevee for the first one and then you would be able to pick up things like literature or um, things that she would be more proficient in and then you as a player would have all this information to decide for yourself which is what we also get but while the first mission would deliberately have you initially choose the wrong answer later missions would then let you have a point where you could swap or you could swap like you would in the real world at any point that you wanted to try and pick up a thing and then say you have to go to another location to talk to someone who then gives you more information if you go back as a different character as the other twin then a whole different point of this exploration would be uncovered for you and you would be able to expand even further or maybe even some locations are blocked off for a character. Say, Jacob's not going to go to a library or a museum. It's out of character. Like, Evie will go to fight clubs and stuff, but it's more Jacob's dream. It. And there's stuff that Jacob will do that Evie won't, and Evie will do stuff that Jacob won't. And I'm aware that there was a load of backlash for the outfits of several characters, in particular um, Lucy Thorne, who's, let's be honest, her outfit looks more prepared for a steampunk novel than it does the actual 1860s. But there's kind of like a historical remit for that. Um, in the 1881, the Rational Dress Society was founded in London, with leading members including Constance Wilde the wife of Oscar Wilde, and the organisation was founded with its purpose described as thus, to protest against the introduction of any fashion in dress that either deforms the figure, impedes the movements of the body, or in any ways tends to injure the health. It protests against the wearing of tightly fitted corsets, of heavy-weighted skirts, of all tie-down cloaks or other garments impeding on the movement of the arms. And it was a point that some people picked up with Evie's design as well, is that why is she not wearing a dress or why is she not wearing the layers of skirts and the bodice and the crinoline women did wear trousers in the victorian period guys it was not as common as it is today but they still did there's photographs of them wearing them that are we see in some artworks we see in some writings we see in some letters and the existence of the Rational Dress Society shows that some people really did want to and didn't like being forced to wear this tightly bodied corset. They didn't like to be wearing, you know, the layers and layers of skirts that impeded their dress. Um, while Evie's outfit and Lucy's especially look rather more 21st century and steampunk inspired, there is this sort of historical element there that proves that with a few tweaks to make them more historically accurate, they could fit in. I've also left some links in the description to several YouTube videos surrounding corsetry and the wearing of them, particularly with Bernadette Banner's stuff and the historical costuming on YouTube. They mention how ladies did not typically have that coveted, quote, 19 inch waist as a standard. And it was more like size two supermodels in our day and age. Another video that I've also found looks at what would happen if someone was stabbed wearing a corset, uh, initially inspired by Enola Holmes and that whole thing. But let's be honest, in Evie's like manner of work in the kind of criminal, quote unquote, criminal underworld of London, it might happen once or twice. And while I'm on the subject of clothing, the way that Abilene in AC Liberation had the social stealth where she could change outfits depending on her location or her contract would make sense here. Both Evie and Jacob interact with different levels of, you know, uh, Victorian London society right from the working class up to, you know, the gentry and the royalty. And, you know, they wouldn't be wearing the same outfit they'd go to a fight club in if they were going to meet the Queen or the Prime Minister. So a nice mechanic to kind of add back in would be something that I believe was something in an early leak back when Syndicate was known as AC Victory, which was, um, an, I've only been able to find one image of where Jacob wearing the coat that would become George Westhouse's quickly changes his attire by handing his top hat to a rook or an assassin standing nearby. And I think there's quite a nice dynamic that we could add back in, like the quick change. Maybe it's a little bit too um, Superman in a phone box, but I quite like it. And I'll leave you with two quick thoughts. The biography of Crawford Starrick in Syndicate's database calls him the youngest son, i.e. he must have an older brother. Where is he? What is his name? Uh, why is Crawford the Temple Grandmaster instead of him, if theoretically they both grew up in the Order? Is he dead? Did he defect the assassins? Given the information is located, collated by Templars and 
gradually being edited into their own in-universe version of Syndicate. Perhaps this brother is the assassin, or at least helps Evie, Jacob, and Henry in some way. Maybe this mysterious, unseen, staric brother is the reason behind the letters arriving at the start of each game sequence. But I think I've gone on for long enough. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. It is so good to be back recording again. I have had so many ideas play while playing through Valhalla and revisiting some older games. I've even got my mom to play Origins for the first time in the last couple of months. And it's led me to find some little details that give me some thoughts and some theories of my own, which will, will be coming shortly. Um, some of the points which I skimmed over in this episode could theoretically be made into their own episodes. If there's anything mentioned here that you want to hear more about, then let me know in the comments below. A biography of Henry Green is definitely going to be coming up soon, as are some based around information I found in Valhalla and the historical pieces there. Is there anything specific you would like me to talk about? Maybe a crash course to understanding Viking adoption? Uh, who's who in the Norse pantheon? Or maybe even, what about the Daughters of Lyrian? If you'd like to keep up with the podcast, then please feel free to subscribe here on YouTube. New episodes of the Rookery's Archives will be released every Sunday. Comments are always greatly appreciated, as are your kind words and topic suggestions. All of my other social media links, including Twitter, are linked in the description below, in addition to a sources and reading list if you've grown curious. You can follow along on my Twitter, at the Nerdy Archer, for updates and articles and even more. I've grown very fond of the Valhalla photo mode, so there'll be a lot coming up about that too. But this episode was very much a semi-scripted ramble about Syndicate. But I feel like I've covered a load of different things that even when I started researching this I didn't know about. Like, no one ever mentioned the Rational Dress Society to me before. So I hope this helps teach you a little bit about Victorian history and the stuff that you might not have known as well. Our time has come to end the episode. My name is Louise. You'll probably know me as your archivist here, the Nerdy Archer. And I hope to see you flying back to the Rookery.